Hi everyone. We know that the transition from LIBOR to some other alternative interest rate benchmark is already in process. But do you understand the landmines that we are now, or the financial landmines that we are now entering that threatens the entire system? Central banks are trying to control how this rolls out, but frankly, there are some things that are beyond their control. So if they lose control, what happens? We're going to talk about that today, coming up. everyone and welcome to ITM Trading. I'm Lynette Zhang and today we're going to talk about what's happening and where we are in this transition from LIBOR to some other interest rate environment. This is a critical video. There are links below where you'll be able to go in and look at the um, two videos that I've done to explain why this matters so much. But this transition impacts almost every single financial instrument on the planet and therefore every single corporation and bank and therefore pension funds, mutual funds, a whole host of all of these fiat money products. This is going to have an impact on absolutely everyone. So we're going to take a look at that timeline, but I really want to remind you about the interbank lending. So this is a stated race. This is the LIBOR. This is a stated rate of which the banks will charge each other to borrow overnight. And it was created as a new benchmark, which is really a derivative back in the eighties. And you've got over 300 trillion contracts today that are written against this key rate in 2000. Well, it failed in 2008 and you can see that, but in 2012, that's when the whole world understood that LIBOR was simply a stated rate and as such easy to manipulate. And it was stated, it must go away. And they, and, and I'm going to talk to you about the reason why it must go away in just a minute, but you need to understand that all the fines that the banks paid for manipulating the LIBOR, and remember there are 15 banks that set the LIBOR and 16 banks that paid fines for manipulating the LIBOR to their benefit against the benefit of the public good and other contract holders. So what you have to understand is no, they can't change what's about to happen. And primarily because the banks have a head up on that liability that they're running and they are not willing to take it anymore. So the LIBOR will go away in 2021 at the end of it. Frankly, they've been working central banks globally have been working really hard and developing the alternatives. We've talked about this before, but you really do need to understand that there is no way that they can stop this transition because what used to support the markets, which were the banks are no longer willing to do that. We've been talking about a net more and more narrow base of buyer. Well, this is the one that impacts the interest rates. So normally you would think that knowing that this was going to end and we've known it since, well, 2017 is when the, uh, the financial authority in England announced that they would no longer be publishing this. You would have thought, that that would have made them slow down creating contracts against this rate that's going away, or even maybe, I don't know, changing the language in these contracts to give the note holder greater flexibility. But in reality, they did just the opposite. And the Federal Reserve of San Francisco anticipates that it's twice what it was 
The contract's written against this benchmark that's going away is twice what it was in 2008 when they already knew that it failed and they didn't create the language that is i guess they call it robust enough but that basically locks you into that contract and gives you no choice do you see are you starting to see a little bit of the problem that we're facing because they've given us the timeline and the areas where they don't need a big consensus. So like to choose in this country, the SOFR, S-O-F-R, which is based upon treasury uh, rates that are moving and it's based upon actual, well, pres presumably real rates. I say that because there's nothing real in any of these markets. They're central bank driven or they're trader driven but at least those are based on actual rates that are happening out there. However, they still have to create a market. The easy part is done because this didn't take very much concession. Set choosing the so far or any other alternative rate, that just is a small group of banks that have to agree on it. The Federal Reserve starts to publish it and give it validity and the CME and other exchanges start to create more derivatives. So it's a derivatives on derivatives products and put them out there. Running concurrently with the LIBOR, getting the marketplace used to it. This is how they do it. They put it out there. They give it value. They give it credence and they try and give it enough time so that people participate in this activity. But now we're coming to the hard part because now you have to get a much broader consensus. There are roughly 300 trillion contracts that are written against this and most of those mature after 2021 and the language in the contracts were only based on the LIBOR going away for a very brief moment in time based upon a computer glitch, not a permanent gone. And so none of these contracts are prepared for the closing down, the full shutting down of the LIBOR. And that's what they have to do between 2019 and 2021. That's not a lot of time. So I want you to keep that in mind and they know that they have to create a robust and deep market. They have to get consensus. They have to start writing contracts in terms of SOFR and there have been a few contracts, well, a couple of contracts written because this piece is all brand new this year. But then they have to make sure that there is now standardized language in these new contracts that locks everybody in to this transition. And even if they get that, that's not going to be enough. At the moment, it's all voluntary. It's always voluntary to begin with. And then in 2021, beginning of 2021, everything becomes mandatory. The problem is, is that with 95% of them being derivative contracts and those derivative contracts are so complex and they've been sliced and diced and commingled that where you know, you might have in a bilateral trade, you have two people that have to agree. That's reasonably easy. Getting thousands to agree, that's a lot more challenging. Do you think that they can really do this? But let's presume for a moment that they can. If everything goes on this planned transition as they think it will, well, you know, they've been testing the new benchmarks, the US, Great Britain, Switzerland, Japan, and the Eurozone, they all came up with their own new benchmarks and they've been testing it. Here's the LIBOR, here's the deviation, they're back testing it, but here's the deviation from the LIBOR. So when these contracts convert to that new benchmark, whatever that is, there will be a price 
lo dislocation. There will be. Initially, they're going to give discounts. They're going to try and smooth that out. Maybe they can do it. Maybe they can't. I mean, they honestly, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have had to make these transitions, but they've been tiny, tiny, and so they've basically eaten the difference so that the note holder never knew that anything happened. This is huge. This is over $300 trillion worth of contracts that are going to have to be changed, and they already anticipate how this is going to impact the already severely underfunded pension funds, the retail mortgage impact, though I will tell you, and I uh, uh, up until this particular research, I couldn't find it in writing. So I'm happy that I finally found it in writing. I put the link in there so you can see for yourself. If you do have a fixed rate mortgage, they will count on that mortgage running out. So this is really going to impact all of those variable rate contracts, credit cards, uh, second, you know, uh, consumer mortgages against, or second mortgages that are variable rates, student loans, those kinds of things. New contracts can be written against the, against in this country, the so far, but you can see that that is going to change the pricing of these contracts. And it's going to impact corporate loans and corporate leverage. And all of those, as you saw earlier, I mean, I didn't show you all the charts and graphs, but we all know that the debt levels in all these areas are substantially higher than they were in 2008. So they know that it's going to, for example, impact 300,000 retail customers per bank in the retail mortgage market. And they know that it's going to make the holdings of pension funds, on average, they're anticipating that it's only going to decline, only going to decline by 3% up to 15%. These are significant dislocations because the financial institutions, so JP Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo, all these guys, their valuation is based on the value of the contracts that they hold. Or if they have securitized them, in other words, turned them into other financial products, which a lot of them have been, then that means that you're holding them in your 401k or your IRAs or your variable annuities or your mutual funds or your ETFs. All of these different products are holding these instruments that the price on them will shift. Particularly for banks, this also impacts their valuation and their leverage ratio and therefore the ability for them to, at the end of the year when they do their stress tests, to transfer wealth to shareholders. So the primarily boards of directors, the insiders, like we've talked about. So this is really significant because it's also going to have an impact on everybody's credit rating. If you're suddenly holding a whole lot more debt and you're a whole lot more leveraged, and we know that the credit rating agencies have already been fudging on the credit, uh, the credit ratings of corporations because of all of the high level of debts that they've been building. So... I'm hoping that you can see, because these guys have a plan. And it's real simple. They buy, they hold, they accumulate real money, physical gold. Whether it is Wall Street getting on the bandwagon quietly, quietly, they don't want you to do it. They just reposition themselves to control this market, or the central banks, which they've been accumulating now at levels last seen in 2015. And you can certainly see what the ultra rarity and key dates index does. These coins start at the hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars. So that's how we know what the elites are doing. 
This is their plan. This is their armor to walk through the minefield that we are just about to enter. The easy part of this transition is done where they don't need major consensus among everybody. Now we're entering that part where it gets a whole lot more tricky. And even presuming that some miracle, because it's a big experiment, never been done before, if by some miracle they happen to be able to pull that off, even if they do, the price dislocation of all over 300 trillion products, fiat money products, particularly in the der derivative area, all those valuations will reset. This is it, people. You need to make no mistake about it. I mean, I can't guarantee anything, but I am 100% convinced that this is what's ushering in the global financial reset. And any misstep between now and the end of 2021 will simply ha make that happen a whole lot faster, far faster than you or I or mere mortals will have the ability to react to because this transition is all going to be algorithmic driven. They have their armor. Do you? So I really want you to think about this. The two links to the two previous videos that I've done on LIBOR, click the links below. I think Megan's going to post those in just a couple minutes, but they're going to be there. I would take the time to really go in and look at these slides. Follow the links. There's a lot of great links. Even if I couldn't talk about it, I wanted you to be aware of it. So there's a lot of really fabulous links in here to all the guys that are really trying to make this shift. They don't talk about it on TV. They don't want you to know. They don't want you to be prepared. But we do, and I do, and everybody here at ITM Trading is here to help you understand what's happening and to create a plan. They have a plan you should too. To create a plan that's based upon your goals, your, your circumstances, and what you have to work with. I suggest you give us a call sooner than later because you've got to get ready. We are now walking through financial minefields and any misstep can trigger it. And let's face it, with all the fines that the banks paid, you got to understand, even though we don't know all the wrongdoing that they've done, just the level that we do know about means that they made that many mistakes that they got caught. You think they're going to do this perfect? And again, even if they do, it's not going to matter. So tomorrow I'm inter interviewing with Tradcat Knight. Uh, that will probably be posted Friday. I don't know, but stay tuned to the social media and we'll let you know when that's posted. And uh, tomorrow I'm going to talk more about the markets and Jay Powell, the, the nice little zots that he's given these stock markets and the currency markets. I'm going to look at all of that tonight. And that's what we're going to talk about tomorrow. So until then, keep in mind that shields and armor are made of metal, not paper, not promises. Get your armor ready. And until then, please be safe out there. Bye-bye.